Do you want to learn more on how to put money to work in regenerative food and agriculture? Follow our video course via investing in regenerativeagriculture.com slash course or in the links below. Now on to the podcast. How can we deploy billions in restoring ecosystems, increasing biodiversity and storing a lot of carbon permanently? Reforestation, agroforestry, biochar and enhanced weathering might do the trick. And it all starts in Scotland. Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, a podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why am I focused on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small and consumers, start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. In March last year, we launched our membership community to make it easy for fans to support our work. And so many of you have joined as a member. We've launched different types of benefits, exclusive content, Q&A webinars with former guests, Ask Me Anything sessions, plus so much more to come in the future. For more information on the different tiers, benefits and how to become a member, check gumroad.com slash egg or find the link below. Thank you. So welcome to another episode today with the founder of the Future Forest Company, Jim Mann. Welcome, Jim. Hi, how are you doing? I'm very well, and I am very excited for this interview. I think we've been in touch for many, many months. I mean, a lot of things happened in our personal lives that led to a slower than usual probably recording of this. I'm very excited for this. We're at the end of June 2021 and I'm very excited for this recording. But I want to start a bit with your background story. Why did you end up building the future forest company or why did you end up building a forest company focusing on soil, focus on regeneration? Because it's not where, let's say, you spend most of your working life. No, but it does take me back to my roots. So originally, well, I grew up on a dairy farm in the north of England. Then I went to study ecology at university. And that's kind of where I went off track, I guess. Um, I set up my first business to pay. How does that always happen? Like, I've heard that story many times. I grew up on a farm where I was a lot in nature. I went studying something very connected to that. And then it didn't, like, I didn't just... Didn't happen. There are not enough jobs. What's the point there? Well, there weren't then. I mean, I guess it's probably fortunate because the jobs then were, were testing water for water boards. You know, the ecologists didn't really, you know, a very small cohort. There were, I think, 19 people who specialized in ecology at my university or in my year. And there weren't great job prospects for it. I doubt if more than two of them have actually ended up as ecologists. Back then. But probably in this case, better, I would say. In your case, definitely better. It's given me a different background that I can then apply, I think. So yeah, I think it was probably fortuitous. But I then set up my first business to pay my way through university. And that led me down a business track rather than using the ecology. So I have an ecology degree that I hadn't used for, for many years, um, 15, 20 years. I knew about climate change quite early on, so was well educated in what was happening but I was also confident that um, governments would sort that because that's really government's job. And as you watch that over 15 years and see that nothing's happening, then um, you start to think that maybe actually there is other ways to do it. And, and that's where I ended up five years ago with a good income, um, not needing to actually go to work for that income so that I could sort of spend time unpaid, really figuring out what I wanted to be doing and combining at the time, the ecology back with scaling to tackle climate change, so planting deciduous forests profitably was what I decided that I thought the world needed. And just to unpack that a bit, you said I've, I've looked at basically governments not taking action over 15 and over 20 years. That's a slow process. Do you remember, like you can get very annoyed by that and then not take action because it's so slow. It's like basically seeing, seeing erosion happen. Like you see it happening over time. But it's not something that's in your face every day, except when there's COP21 or COP20 or whatever. Was there a specific moment that you said, okay, now I have to do something? Or was it that moment where you arrived, okay, now I have the space because I have the resources to to unpaid look at that? Or was it a combination of the two or just a gradual process? I'm always interested in these moments. Like, did you see at some point a speech of a politician and you thought, okay, he or she is really not taking, probably he really not taking it seriously. Let's go and do something. Or was it a gradual process that led you into this? Very much gradual. Um, there's no 
light bulb moment, I'm afraid, and um, more just you recognize it's happening. And I think park that and decide that, you know, it's okay because it'll get worse and then someone will take action and, and things get worse and no one takes action and, and things progressively then get worse again and no one takes action. And, and eventually you start to look at, or, or in my case, I start to look at the root cause of that. So why aren't these people who, who clearly know they've got the science, they've had the science for 40 years. And more, actually, if you look like at the original, I, I saw somebody on LinkedIn posting, I think somebody in New Zealand, like it was in 1912, so more than 109 years ago, probably burning this amount of coal is going to heat up the planet by this amount, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a, a very clear greenhouse effect analysis already more than 100 years ago. So it's not that we didn't know, but yeah, we don't and still didn't do anything. And we're still not acting. You know, you can't take a view of what's happening today as real action. It's not at the scale that the problem demands. So we're still in that cycle of whether it's denial or inaction. But if you look at political cycles, you start to realize why they're so ill-equipped to deal with a problem of this scale and over these time horizons. It's going to be on somebody else's watch that the real problems happen. And that means that they tend to focus on the economy or, or trivial things by comparison. And they're not well set up to actually take on something of this scale. And as some would argue, companies aren't either focused on, in many cases, short-term results. In many cases, the market is, is demanding quotes. I mean, we're sending out CEOs that, that are making bold claims about food and agriculture, sustainability, etc. I'm just looking at Unilever and Danone that have been pressured on certain things. And, and I'm sure there are others. So you, with a back, business background and an ecology background, obviously, decided to start a future forest company. Like in essence, a thing that is slow. Like how did that come about? Apart from the fact that it's obviously necessary, why did you choose that piece of the whole ecology spectrum that you could have chosen back then? Because we've actually got two big problems, which are firstly climate change and the way we view the world as an organization is that our number one goal is to tackle climate change, to remove CO2 from the atmosphere at scale. And secondly, we look at the biodiversity crisis um, restoring ecological systems, particularly native forests, is a very good tool for that. And it could be other, you know, we talk about forests uh, as sort of the emotional attachment people have are, is often with trees, but it could be any ecosystem that you're restoring to bring that biodiversity back. And thirdly, it's profit. And I explored all different models from educating, sort of training people. Would it be a training center? Would it be a, an NGO? And putting pressure onto governments to actually get them to act. But what I felt was that there was nobody actually doing or not enough people actually doing. And I'm, I'm discovering that there are quite a lot of people actually doing now. Luckily. <laughs> yeah, and we need more of them, vastly more of them. But action was the point that seemed to be missing. The Building something that could genuinely scale was a big gap in, in things. There were lots of people educating, lots of people training, and it seemed like the default in, in regenerative ag was people would have a, a farm and then teach other people. And... And that can have impact and it takes time for a movement like that to spread. But actually having something that could be scaled and therefore could be repeatedly done um, felt like a bigger and more important way to tackle things. So let's talk about what you are doing and what is being repeatedly done at the moment. What is the future forest company? Let's unpack that a bit. What you, you mentioned scale a number of times. Uh, biodiversity, native forests, I think people are very curious, and regenerative ag, people are very curious about what you're currently building. Yeah, so we ended up a bit off track, and that was with the realization, having worked out how to profitably reforest, um, we realized, or, or I realized, that actually there isn't enough land on the planet, and the competition for land on this planet is too intense and causes social problems if you start taking land away from people. So actually realizing that and that reforestation alone wasn't a solution was a key moment. So what we're now doing is we continue to reforest, we continue to restore ecosystems and try and minimize leakage. And I'm, I'm sure we can come on to that in more, more detail. But we also co-deploy biochar production and enhanced weathering. That means we can 10x the carbon removal on any piece of land without having negative impacts elsewhere. So... You went for, let's say, the biochar and enhanced weathering, and, and let's explore that in a sec. Also, what that exactly means. 
to basically 10x the potential carbon removal, which means you need less land to reforest. That's right. Or you store a lot more carbon. Like it works on both sides, obviously. So what are you doing with biochar and enhanced weathering? And what is enhanced weathering, first of all? So biochar, we're, we're taking forestry waste. We're just getting started on that on our first site for it. So this is the brush that's left behind when trees are felled for commercial timber. And we're harvesting that to turn into biochar, which stores the carbon for a lot longer than if that brush is left on the forest floor, which is typically what happens. So as that brush rots over 15, 20 years, it will release most of the carbon back into the atmosphere, either as CO2 or as methane. By fixing it through biochar process, that carbon will stay as, a, as effectively a powdered charcoal, um, which we can put back into the soil, where it helps improve the soil, but also um, stores the carbon for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Preventing the rotting and storing the carbon. That is part, I mean, the rotting is part of a natural cycle, but of course, if you start cutting the trees, you increasing the amount of rotting quite exponentially. If you start also pruning them and making sure that the forest is healthy, there's a lot of waste, I can, I can imagine. And when they're clear felling, which is the model with Sitka spruce in Scotland, about a quarter of the biomass that's been accumulated in that area will be left on the forest wow. floor, won't be extracted as timber. So it's significant volumes of timber. It's not usable timber in most cases, but it's significant amounts of biomass that you can then fix to prevent that release of, of CO2. And you get paid for it because the biochar, you can turn it into a carbon credit, basically, as the biochar is stored and hasn't been, won't rot as the timber would have. So that's a huge amount of CO2 greenhouse gases prevented to go up in the air. That's right. And that's largely our core business model is carbon credits and carbon removal. How has that market been? Because there's, I think, an enormous interest at the moment. I can sense an amount of cowboys entering the space as well, which is crazy. At the same time, we need it. We absolutely need a healthy carbon market. What have you seen in the space? And then we get to enhance weathering. Don't worry, listeners, we're, we're getting there. But I'm very curious of, I think people would already be curious that you can actually sell carbon credits coming from biochar. It's something that sounds super interesting. Well, biochar is a pretty good one because you can measure it well and the permanence is well understood. You can measure the tonnage. You have to, yeah, it has to go through your hands anyway, left or right. Yeah. yeah. And where I'm more skeptical is things like soil carbon, which I'm sure is a big thing for a lot of the audience. But the problem I have with both soil carbon and tree carbon, and we do sell tree carbon and soil carbon as well. But the problem I have with both of those is if you change the management practice, that can be reversed very quickly. Um, management practice could be as simple with the tree as a chainsaw and a, and a match. And a plow, yeah. Yeah, and a plow for the soil, you can reverse that carbon capture very quickly. How do you tackle that in your sites and your operation? That fear, rightfully so, is there for many clients that say, I would love to, I've been working on my carbon budget of my company and this is just this last, the ideal case, this last piece that I cannot, I need to offset it. I cannot reduce it, I need to offset it and I'm working or I need to almost inset it, I need to work with this first or this ecosystem, but yeah, I want to make sure that it's going to stay up also after 20 years and more, because we all know these examples of, yeah, of course, we paid for the trees to stay there. And then somebody changed their management practices, aka a chainsaw or a plow. Yeah. So what is the solution there that you found to make sure that that can never happen? So from our side, there's a couple of things. Um, we're very careful about where we operate. We want to operate where there is a strong rule of law. Um, where ownership of land means that we've got good control over it into perpetuity so that if we plant a forest, that forest will be left there. We're not having to put armed guards around our forest to stop illegal logging or anything like that. And you own the land in all cases? We do. We buy the land in all cases to make sure that we have that level of ownership. It might not be that we'll always buy it going forward, but we will want to know that we have control over that land into a distant future. Um, the other things we do to try and ensure permanence are we pick the location for the tree planting in particular where we've got a very low risk of forest fire. Um, if you've ever been to Scotland, you'll know that you know a drought here is two or three days on the west coast of Scotland um, between rainfall and the chance of a, a forest fire. Unfortunately, many places aren't like that. I mean, exactly. We can all see the droughts in the huge heat waves in the US at the moment, and I'm sure we'll have an interesting summer in many places in Europe as well. So yeah, that's tricky. So we try and avoid areas where there's a high risk to our forests. Um, 
the permanence on soil, again, if you've got a good rule of law and you're putting a forest over the top of it, that soil is pretty secure and the soil carbon therefore for has a higher value. So you're able to sell the soil carbon as well as the tree carbon in, on the same project. Yeah. And then the biochar and the enhanced weathering, we'll get to that. Correct. Uh, so it's a f- almost four layer and you're not even talking about biodiversity yet, but that would be interesting credits as well. Exactly. And biodiversity is another potential area to monetize as we do this. So yeah, that's basically how we try and protect it. We're very careful about our, our location selection. And the enhanced weathering, what is that? The biochar we covered briefly. I know there's a whole world of biochar fans out there and biochar gurus, but this is a very interesting angle. It also helps the soil, as I know, but what is enhanced weathering? So enhanced weathering is based on natural rock weathering process. Just divert into a quick chemistry lesson, but I'll keep it lightweight for you. So as rainwater falls through the atmosphere, it dissolves CO2. And that leads to a weak carbonic acid. That carbonic acid, so all all rainfall is slightly acidic as a carbonic acid. And that will create a chemical reaction with basic rocks. So alkali rocks, which precipitates certain types of rock, will then precipitate carbonates, which is a permanent store of the CO2. So this actually removes CO2 from the atmosphere. So certain places rain can store CO2. That's right. If it hits the right rock at the right time, etc. That's it. So Scotland is like a massive carbon sink. Well, it should be, but you've got to intervene if you want it to work at really big scale. Hence the enhanced piece, yeah. So as things stand, this cycle globally removes between 10 and 100 million metric tons of CO2 from our atmosphere every year. It's one of the key geological um, sinks for carbon dioxide from our atmosphere, which is why we haven't yet fully cooked. Um, To increase that cycle and the speed of that cycle, we take certain types of rock, we grind them up into a fine dust and we put them onto the ground and then we wait for it to rain and that increases the rate of the reaction and allows us to remove a lot more CO2 from the atmosphere through that process. So together with the biochar you're saying at 10x, just to put it in perspective, like let's talk about an acre or a hectare in Scotland, what's your average carbon potential there if things are good or things are average, let's say? What do you see? So you're looking at about, well, 400, you'll get about 400 tons of carbon in a standing, per hectare, in a standing forest, um, somewhere around there. Per year? No, total 400 tons once it's fully grown. Which is 10 years or 15, 20, what's your... If you're planting deciduous forest like we are, you'll be talking 60 years to get to that sort of carbon balance. It can go higher with deciduous forest as well. Um, But if you've got something like Sitka spruce, um, again, that'll grow quicker and store that carbon with enhanced weathering. So depending on how you view that, you know, maybe six tons per year or something around that level, we can get 13 tons a year of carbon removal from enhanced weathering. And biochar is more reliant on feedstock. We could put down quite a lot of biochar on the ground if we can get access to enough feedstock. The big difference is that enhanced weathering is permanent. Once that process has occurred, that carbon dioxide is locked up in geological formations. So you're talking 100,000 years to a million years, depending on which pathway it goes. But all of that carbon is permanently removed. So in human terms, we don't have to worry about it again. Which probably means like why you're able to sell that enhanced weathering credits, even though it's quite experimental, at least at a scale. There are companies or there are buyers of these credits interested in that side of experimentation. To a degree, they're funding our research and development at this stage with a a high degree of confidence that we'll be able to remove that CO2 for them. Are you willing, I mean, obviously say no, if not to share, like what kind of tonnage prices you're getting? Or is that something that you're rather not sure? Yeah, it's out in the public domain. So um, Stripe, who are one of our our backers, um, who some people will know from credit card processing, they have bought credits from us. They published everything around that. They're very transparent. They're paying us $200 per ton of CO2 for that carbon dioxide removal through enhanced weathering. Which is a very significant price per ton, which they hope and you hope probably also comes down at some point. But now, do you feel that that's the carbon market's role at the moment like there are very good prices for very specific niches at the moment and basically funding a lot of your development and maybe others to really see okay how do we do ecosystem restoration and regeneration at scale 
And we all know that that market is not going to last forever. It might go up and down. It will be a rough ride. Or maybe the biochar market goes up and, you know, sweatering comes down, et cetera. But do you see that as a, a short term to kickstart a lot of things? Or do you see the, the CO2 or the carbon markets differently? No, I see them somewhat differently. Um, I think that permanent carbon removal will continue to be a high priced product. Um, I think it's in a different asset class to soil and tree carbon and it rightfully should have a higher price. We have a very, very big problem. Um, demand outstrips supply. We, we could sell 10 times easily the amount of carbon we're producing without any outbound marketing. As things stand, and if you look at all the pledges coming from companies, this is going to grow and grow, but quality, I think, is going to become more and more important in the marketplace because there are too many dodgy schemes so uh, Kyoto era credits that are really not worth the, the, the junk bonds. They've not really removed any carbon. They're pretty sketchy schemes. Um, I worry, as I alluded to, about soil carbon, particularly in arable soils where you can just drag a plough over it and release it again. I'm not saying that farmers intend to do that, but a change in management regime will release that carbon almost virtually immediately. So walk us through like a, an average project. What do we, as this is audio, so make it as visual as possible. What does the land look like when you buy it? And then what happens over the, the years very quickly and slowly at the same time? How does this change? And how is it different from a standard, a relatively standard, let's say, between brackets, reforestation project that you that some people might know it might even help with to plant some trees here and there? Yeah, you wouldn't see a huge difference between what we're doing on the ground and uh, and another reforestation project. We hope that the trees will grow quicker and we're not far enough into it to know that yet. But the biochar acts as a fertilizer as well. So sorry, not the biochar, the biochar acts as a, a soil amendment. So it'll help against drought and will store nutrients. The enhanced weathering material actually acts as a fertilizer. It releases cations, which depending on what state the soil is in, will cause the, the forest to actually grow quicker as well. So you might see our forests developing quicker, but we're doing the science behind our planting at the moment to demonstrate that. We're not far enough on with this in any location to have that data yet. Um, you would see typically degraded land would be our, our focus. Like an, an old dairy farm or like a, a sheep farm, or what would you imagine in Scotland that you're, you're buying? Yeah, so it's often extensive grazing operations that aren't particularly well managed. So... For instance, we have a site where we, we have about 2,000 acres, so what, about 800 hectares. And we think there we're moving on to a rotational grazing model with the, the livestock to make it far more intensive. We're moving them onto the better land. We'll probably only use a crazy amount of the land, less than 10% of the land, to actually graze all the livestock on. Once we move them onto a rotational grazing, things like lambing rates are terrible. So just by better, better look. Basically improving, intensifying the farming side of things and then taking the rest into the forestry or reforestation. Yeah, to prevent leakage. So what we don't want is the unintended consequences of taking that land out of, uh, out of action. But we also try and introduce, and again, we're too early to know how well this will work, but we're introducing nut crops and fruit crops so that we are um, displacing some of the meat production, which we don't think is a, a long-term model that we really want to be doing but we also don't want to create unintended consequences in clearing of brazilian rainforest the classic example and the danger is that we act as do-gooders in scotland and we plant up a thousand acres in scotland and that requires somewhere around three thousand acres of amazonian rainforest to get the same production that needs clearing so we've just planted a thousand acres and cleared 3,000 acres of rainforest by accident, which we want to completely avoid. So leakage becomes a really key thing for us to think about. But the more of that we can move to permanent nut crops, for example, the better. And so that basically turns it into an agroforestry system and not necessarily a, just a just between brackets of forest. Where do you see that going? Yeah, and even the grazing system will be agroforestry. So the way we're not quite sure on those bits yet, but we're hoping to actually find regenerative farmers who want to operate those. It's not what we actually do to scale and to have the impact that we want to have. It doesn't fit into our, our core model. So we're doing that, but we want to find farmers who want those opportunities. 
And just in terms of scale, how many hectares or acres are you currently owning? Just to give a sense of, uh, this isn't a few here and there. No, it's growing quite rapidly. So at last count, I think we've got about 5,000 hectares under management. Wow. And that's over a two-year period. And we're currently seeking debt funding to expand that further with an intention of getting to 50,000 hectares as fast as we possibly can. Because you said there's such a demand for the credits you're producing. Can you walk us through, because it was going to be my next question, but how do you finance it? You mentioned debt funding. What is a typical typical structure look like and where do you see that going? Because we've mentioned scale quite a bit at the beginning of this interview to see where you can see this model or these models because they're, they're all context specific go. And what's the role of, because you mentioned profit uh, also at the beginning, what's the role of money there? So at the moment, we typically are financing this through high net worths who are lending us money and getting a commercial return on it. Um, we secure their money on the asset so that they've got an asset backed security effectively and earning interest from us. Um, the company itself is funded through equity investment and we've been very successful with the equity investment to date, but we also are generating cash from sale of credits and building out the operations there. Further forward, we see this as an institutional investment proposition. So the difficulty with institutional investment is that's not an early stage thing. You need to get to a certain size before it's of interest. What do you think that size is? Like, what, what are you currently targeting in depth and how many X do you need to go before institutionals will become interested? We think you need to get to, well, it certainly needs to be several tens of millions of dollars before larger institutions are interested. We are now having conversations with institutions who can deploy slightly smaller checks, but also some that potentially can do the $100 million checks that we ultimately want to be taking for land purchases. Again, as depth, meaning buying the land, doing that process, earning an interest on that, and then the land that stays with the future forest company as we discussed before. That's right. And we always have that hold over the land. So that land's coming back to us as long as we don't default on our debt, obviously. But to date, that's not been a problem. But yeah, it's a case of using debt to buy the land so we can generate the revenue to pay back. And most of the revenue comes from the credits and will continue to generate. I mean, 60 years is a long period before it hits a plateau. And, and we might have figured out a lot of other ways by then to add on to the biochar and enhanced weathering to speed that up even further. So it's basically how many X do you need to grow? Like you're doing a couple of million now in depth or looking for a couple of million. You need to go to, you said 20, 30, 50 before these bigger insurance companies, et cetera, become interested, or they're already talking to you and they might, might want to get you there because that will be even more interesting. Yeah. They're starting to talk to us now. And um, we have institutions who potentially will write us tens of millions of checks. We're not at the stage yet where anybody's knocking our door down to give us a hundred million pound checks, but hopefully we're not that far off it. Because the demand is there, just to be clear, the demand of credits is there and is the land also there to get your hands on in those places with the, the right rule of law and the right weather where fires are not so dangerous. The land is there. We have the pipelines. We have our investment thesis behind that. We know which sort of areas of the world we want to operate in. Won't obviously just be Scotland. Scotland is big, but not that big. Yeah. It's nowhere near big enough for what we're trying to achieve. So we have target areas where we want to buy land and we're building out the organization that will be capable of managing that. So, yeah, I think. Yeah, because massive tree plantation plus, of course, you have to find the farmers, but still potentially managing animals at the beginning, planting tree crops like nut trees. Are you going to harvest that as well? Are you going to go into the, the agriculture, the food side of things? Or how do you see that? We don't see that as part of our core business. Um, I think we'll have to demonstrate that, prove that out. But we hope that again, that we can find partners who want to do that. Um, we think that part of the barrier to regenerative agriculture is access to land. And whilst we're doing the other things, we can facilitate that. So when you get into farming, you've got to know that land, you've got to really build a bond with that land. And that's hard to do. Um, as a large organization, I think it's far better to have farmers who know their, the area that they're farming. So hopefully we'll be able to facilitate that. Otherwise you end up in a one size fits all cropping system, which we all know exists and has big farming operators on it and brings with it a range of other problems. 
And have you seen that already? Like the local community or the around the properties you've bought? I mean, 5,000 is not a small number. How's been the response and the willingness or potential interest to engage, to work with you, to work potentially the land in a different way than it was found before? I think it's always um, mixed. There's people who have a traditional view or a view of how it, the world's always been around them and don't want that to change. There are also people who get excited by a vision of a different future. So I think it's always going to be something where we try and take people with us, but you're never going to please everybody all the time. No, you shouldn't. Otherwise, you're doing something wrong. And where do you see, I mean, you mentioned leakage a few times, obviously, or potentially don't want to create this ecosystem with a big fence around it, obviously protected, but where do you see this agroforestry or the food piece with the nuts, etc.? What else do you see there potentially in these ecosystems that could produce calories for us to eat? Are there any other things you're working on there to enhance, to not damage obviously the biochar and the enhance weathering, but also to create other income streams or other usage of the land and, and only the biodiversity, which is extremely important, uh, but not the only use. No, but we're clearly creating a timber crop though as well of some sort. And whilst we don't set our stall out as harvesting timber. We're not a forestry company in that way. Um, there's questions about what we do with the forest long term because you want to be reusing that land ultimately to sequester more carbon. Once a forest hits sort of balance point, it's no longer providing that carbon removing service. So there's an argument to say that we should be selectively felling. It's not a decision I'll ever have to make with these forests. I'll be long retired, hopefully, but in 60 years' time, I think we probably should be taking a very, very light-touch approach to harvesting high-quality hardwood timber from the forests. Um, it will actually benefit the forests in terms of creating mixed-age forests, so mixed habitat. Regrowth. Yeah, and the regrowth that will come through there creates a new type of habitat, a different type of habitat. In natural forests, you don't have all one age, and that's the problem with planting trees. You tend to plant them all at the same time they're all going to be the same age. So some selective thinning helps, some selective harvesting probably will help. But it's also contentious because these aren't easy things to communicate with people. Um, people think that tree is good and cutting tree is bad. So um, what they don't appreciate is that if we take that timber at the right time, probably um, make high quality furniture, for example, as one of the products, that might then store that carbon for a further thousand years in people's homes, which is what we ultimately want to happen with it. And in its place, there'll be another tree growing, taking four tons of carbon, six tons of carbon dioxide per hectare out of the atmosphere every year. So I think there's more holistic ways of managing these. There is a lot of education there. <laughs> yeah, it's very hard. It's hard to communicate with that to people. But I paid for the tree. Yeah, but it's better if we cut it now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah people don't get, get that. And there's also this very polarized monoculture plantations bad and and mixed species good now we'd much prefer the mixed species because of the biodiversity net gain but at the same time we need more timber um, if we're going to displace carbon products carbon heavy products like cement in our building materials so these are really complicated issues and whilst it's great to tell a simple story from a communications point of view it's usually wrong. Yeah, every complex, I don't remember the quote, I have to find it. Every complex problem has a very simple solution that's also wrong. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds nice on paper, but it doesn't work. Yeah. And it's for sure creates some issues somewhere else or actually in the same place. Ecosystems don't function like that. These are nonlinear um, sort of relationships and, and you need to treat them as, as such. So, um, yeah, I'm glad that's not probably not going to be on my watch to decide about felling trees that we've planted. But um, and maybe it might grow so fast that you actually have to. Yeah, that would be a good problem to have. And yeah. so how was that journey with, you mentioned, I mean, the debt investors, I can completely understand. They get a, a nice coupon on their debt. And at some point you buy back uh, basically the initial investments, the land stays with you, but they get an interesting, any return at this stage is interesting and there's a good story. But the equity ones, this is a very long-term play. A lot of interesting, let's say, revenue opportunities now, revenue coming in, etc. But I'm imagining you picked your investors as long-term investors with you as well. How was that journey? Were they all, did they need a lot of education? What was the biggest surprise you got from people wanting to invest, but 
potentially not getting what you were building. I'm always curious what the response is from the investment world to things like this, holistic, compared to a lot of the linear things they might get on their desk. So the biggest surprise was how easy it was for us to raise investment and how fast it happened. That's good to hear, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so our first investment came from two meetings in one day and we were oversubscribed seven and a half fold. Wow. That was very fortunate the second time. But did they all get it or they were just believing you? No, I think they got the scale of the problem that we're facing and that we were developing models to tackle that without really knowing where we'd end up at that stage. And that's that's kind of the nice thing with a very early stage investment is it? it's a bit, I guess people are investing in, in the vision of where you're going and and they know you're going to deviate from that or they expect you to deviate from that. So you get quite a lot of wriggle room. Going back to raise more money, you've got to have something a bit more tangible. And we raised a second round of investment. Um, it closed, what, about three months ago now. And again, we were pleasantly surprised to significantly over-raise and at a very good valuation with some great investors. And no, I won't, I won't disclose what that is because we've not announced it yet. I wasn't going to ask. Don't worry. Don't worry. I wasn't going to ask. <laughs> and we probably won't, we won't announce it, I don't think. No, but I'm, it's, it's very interesting because I think hopefully shows there is a group of investors out there that sees the scale of the problem or all the problems and is willing to place at least some bets and, and make sure people like you and the whole team can get to work and figure out a lot of things as we don't know a lot of things, but we do know we need a lot more ecosystems and a lot more biodiversity. Yeah, for sure. And I think there are investors there who are, are keen to back the right, the right projects. And I don't think that makes it easy to raise investment. I think there's, there's a, a piece of understanding how to scale the business, how to grow the business, because that's ultimately where they get the returns from. So. And to ask a few questions that I always like to ask, and not necessarily to end with, but I always like to repeat a few of those and, and see the response. What do you believe to be true about regenerative agriculture that others don't? So where are you contrarian? This is definitely inspired by John Kempf that always asks a similar question. So where do you see, I, I can see a number of things. What's the main thing where you see yourself contrarian in, let's say, the whole regeneration movement? Yeah, farming is not the revenue. Farming might be the model and might be the desire and might be why people want to do it, but you're selling a commodity at that point. And I think people understand the sort of idea of selling a story and attaching a story to your product. But actually, I think there's going to be far more money in this space for people who are selling other services. And they might be farming still. I hope they'll still be farming because we still need to feed people. But the other value adds around that, carbon, and biodiversity, which we've sort of touched on a couple of times, but, but I think biodiversity is going to become a huge element of farming. I hope it will, because it will bring farming back to being a, a positive impact on the landscape, as opposed to what has been, for certainly my lifetime, a negative impact on our, our landscape. Very, very much negative impact, yeah. And if you could change one thing, so if you have a magic wand and you could change one thing in the food, agriculture, but let's say the general land use space, what would you do? Can I get rid of Monsanto? Of course. Can I just make them disappear? <laughs> but all of the chemical input, I mean, because there are many others, they're not the only one. That's, I'm always scared, like saying, let's get rid of this one pesticide, which actually is, I think, off patent and made by a lot of other people. And then I'm for sure somebody finds another cocktail. That's my fear of naming a blame. I say that tongue in cheek. Um, I think they symbolize something, but in actual fact, if we're to feed people and we don't want to cause all kinds of social problems, then actually they're part of the ecosystem right now. So the two things I would change, which are very closely related, are I would bring in a global carbon tax on everything, embodied energy in every product we buy everywhere, and a biodiversity tax, so that both of those products could be monetized by good land managers. And... This might be actually not so far off, but what, so we take your magic wand away, but you are in charge of a $1 billion or a billion pounds sterling or euro, whatever you prefer, investment fund. And you have a potentially long-term view if you want to, but it has to be, it is a return focused, any return. What would you focus on? What would you invest this amount in? Would it go to technology? Would it go to buying a lot of land? Would it go to 
getting ready for attacks like you just described? What, what would you focus on as a new fund manager that's managing quite a large amount? I would be buying land that's under conventional, sorry, I hate that term, I shouldn't use it. I was going to say under conventional agriculture. It's not conventional, it's... Extractive agriculture. Extractive agriculture, yeah, chemical agriculture. I'd buy big swathes of land that are being mismanaged and degraded and put them under... Specific places, if you had that freedom to go anywhere, are there specific hotspots where you would act? Would it be Scotland or not? Scotland would be one of them. And we have our investment thesis, which I'm not going to get into, but we have a, a number of other locations where we would... And we'd deploy that. You know, if, if a billion dollars wouldn't go that far. Yeah. Um, I think we'd have that spent within 18 months for you. I should increase this question to like 10 or 100. Oh, it needs to be 10. It doesn't, yeah, yeah. it doesn't scare people anymore. I need to change my questions. Okay, listeners, next time it will be a few zeros more because we printed so much of this stuff. And land is expensive in a lot of places, not all. But in a lot of places, yeah, a billion doesn't go that far. If I talk to a technologist, it's very different. They would have a lot of different places to put this. But yeah, as soon as you talk about land, it absorbs it quite quickly. And so where do you see where now, just before the summer, I mean, depends where you are, maybe it's already summer or maybe you're in the middle of the winter. What is the biggest thing for the next, let's say, you mentioned 18 months, let's use 18 months for you now to go through. And if we talk in a year, where will you be if we talk like in 12 months or so? What's the biggest barrier? Is it more depth? Is it depth? Sorry, not depth also, but more depth. Is it more staff? What's the biggest barrier? More land? So we're doing quite well, I think, on scaling up the team at the moment, that we will end up growing the team. Um, more debt for buying more land, certainly. More access to land, hopefully new ways of us um, having long-term control over land that enable us to scale. Meaning you're potentially not buying, but getting control long, long, long term. I'm thinking hundreds of years, you don't need to own it. Yeah. Which then the billion goes a lot further suddenly. A lot further, yeah. And I think we'll see a very significant change in the amount of carbon that we're sequestering. And we'll probably make some pretty big public commitments to that in the very near future. Meaning you're like underestimating currently or you're looking at other technologies or other ways to push that further, the 10x you mentioned? No, existing technologies, but with different models to serious scale sooner. And that's the challenge when our objectives are primarily to remove carbon. How do we maximize that carbon removal with... Like, how do you get biochar everywhere? Yeah, how do we stop any waste being burnt on a field? No one should be burning their crop waste. Um, biochar it and make it valuable. And get the carbon credits, install the carbon, and enhance your soil for future generations. Um, why aren't we all applying mineral fertilizers as opposed to buying NPK fertilizers made from oil? Um, how do we, you know, and removing... CO2 from the atmosphere at the same time. Could you see that as, as spin-offs as well? Like you're going to work, no, two questions. You're going to work with land you don't own and have that knowledge of biochar spread and have that literally and have that enhanced weathering spread beyond your own land and potentially have a lot more impact than you could have on the land you own. Is that something you could see happening? I'm not saying you should be working on it now. Probably not, but. We're exploring a number of angles to have more impact. I started this business for impact and try and revisit that on a regular basis as to whether I'm using my time in the most valuable way to create impact and whether the organization as a whole is using its time in the most valuable way to create impact. And sometimes maximizing impact isn't by doing, even though we started off as a doing organization. Um, there's a point in time when sometimes you're better to find a broader way of interacting with land um, in this case to have a much bigger impact. Leverage. Yes. It all comes down to leverage at the end. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes you've got to demonstrate before you've got that leverage. And some of the products, perhaps we're at a point where, yes, we want to continue scaling. Yes, we want to continue enhancing and protecting biodiversity. And that means operating land. But some of the other products, perhaps there's ways we can use our, our know-how, the methodologies we're developing and things like that to benefit other people as well and with that i think we reach a, a perfect end of this podcast i don't want to take any more of your time because it's very valuable i want to thank you so much jim to come on and actually i have one small last question as a small retail investor do you see any i mean you're talking about institutionals and of course some of our pension i do this often that it's a final question and it's actually not but do you see any role potentially for ordinary people putting some of their savings in things like this, or does it have to go through our pension funds and our insurance companies and our banks, etc.? 
Yes, and I think we've got to find ways of doing that, and we don't have them today. Because for the people that are around, like the, especially the skeptical ones that are nearby, that would be a great way. I know many in the energy space, renewable energy space, have, have successfully tackled the not in my backyard syndrome by letting people invest in the wind turbine nearby or the solar systems. And I think we in the land use space and agriculture space need to do the same. Plus, I really want to as well as a small investor. That's, I'm just frustrated. I can't. That's just my frustration speaking now. And is that, do you think there are a lot more people like you in that way? I think so. I mean, if you look at, uh, I follow necessarily just the renewable energy space, the, the crowd lending space, for instance, and in the Netherlands and in Italy as well and some other places, and you see projects are filling up quickly on the, I would say the right platforms between brackets, like the ones you that have a track record, record etc. They seem to have a clear lack of projects and puts bigger and bigger ones. I see some 15 million wind parks coming by. 15. So that's serious. Not a lot, but it's serious. It's, it's not a few hundred thousand here and there. And they fill up and they fill up in a couple of weeks. And the smaller ones of a million or two fill up in less than a day. And sometimes I'm late if it's like it goes online at 10 in the morning and it's filled up by five past 10. And I'm like, wow, okay, there is money for, I think, two, no, four, five, six percent, sometimes quite securitized, sometimes not. I mean, it's not the riskier stuff, but there's apparently there's money also from ordinary folks looking for a return and an impact in this case in the energy space. So I would say yes, but I hope I'm right in this case. So where we, we did explore this and, and we struggled to find a platform that was easy to work with, was a reasonable cost on the finance and decided it was easier working with high net worths at this stage. I think there's a combi to be made. Yeah, there's a role for the local crowd or the crowd in general, and there's a role for high net worth and institutional. And it's, I think, finding that balance in the dance to make it go fast enough and not have too much admin and costs, but also make it inclusive enough. And yeah, it's not an easy one. And if there's anyone out there with a platform who's listening, who's got a platform that'll do that, you know, get in touch. We'd love to try it. I'd love to democratize the ownership of the land and to allow people to to be involved that's a whole other podcast we need to do on that yeah <laughs> oh, well, there's some interesting bits there that we're trying to look at but it's about focus as well and trying to keep yeah no of course i think i mean we had then miller of stewart on the podcast and i think mimosa a similar platform in france just raised money from astana which we didn't have on a podcast yet eric if you're listening we need to get you but there are some people exploring the land use space way less than the energy space i think we can learn a lot from people there and i know People at one, two, three are very interested in the democratization piece as well. So there are people thinking about it, but it's like, yeah, we can open a bank account with a smartphone in three clicks. Why can't we not invest in these things? Yeah. It gets really, really frustrating. But yeah, we have to figure it out. And fractional ownership becomes a real problem when you get to property. But there are tools to do that now, I think. Uh, it just needs the right um, time commitment to it and focus on it, which, which might not be us. Which is not now. <laughs> no, it's definitely not now. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jim, for your time. I want to thank you for your commitment to the space, what you're building, your openness, and looking forward to check in regularly and see where you're at. Thank you for having us on. It's great to speak with you. If you found the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast valuable, there are a few simple ways you can use to support it. Number one, rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. It's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast, and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. Number three, if this podcast has been of value to you, and if you have the means, please join my membership community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on gumroad.com slash egg or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast. Dear friends of the podcast, I'm super excited to share with you the online video course Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food. How to put money to work in regenerating soils at scale and growing a lot of tasty food while doing it. Why are we doing this course? After 100 interviews and more than 100 hours of audio asking the question how to put money to work in regenerating soils, and have been following the space since 2011 and recording this podcast since 2016, we thought it was time to share our lessons learned. What have we seen in the space over the last years? How have we built our decision-making framework? What to focus on with the podcast? How have we picked interviewees? And what questions should you ask? What is happening in the space? What should you read? What should you uh, listen? What should you watch? 
how to approach this space. For whom is this course? You, the soy builders and investors in this space. The soy builders, people working in this space, entrepreneurial farmers, fund managers, vehicle builders, crowd investing, platform builders, ag tech companies, farm to gut food companies, permaculture, key line designers, holistic management consultants, etc., etc. People that are building soil at scale. And the investors who are putting their own money to work through their family office or as private individuals or people who are putting other people's money to work through foundations, um, institutional capital, banks, insurance companies, etc. Is this course free? No. This is pay what you think it's worth. Meaning I have no way of knowing what this course will be worth to you. And I'm very aware that among the listeners of this podcast, um, we have people with very different means. So I'm inviting you. If this course is creating value to you and if you have the means to consider paying what you think it's worth. Thank you. So what is this course? It's currently a series of 17 videos, mostly ranging from 10 to 15 minutes, plus PDF slides, so you don't have to write along. We're going to look into why invest in regenerative agriculture and why extractive agriculture is so risky, how to invest, what kind of frameworks you could and I think should build, what to invest in, Uh, what kind of co-investors you could find or what kind of investors you could find if you're a soy builder. Every lesson will have a digging deeper part where I will share what kind of reports, what kind of interviews, what kind of videos you can look into if you want to dig deeper. We're going to look at nutrient density, landscape design and a lot more. So what is it not? It's not a list of investable deals. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist in this world. We're really at the beginning of the regenerative agriculture and food revolution. It's also not investment advice. Before making any investment, please find professional investment advice. So get ready, get a cup of coffee, a cup of tea or whatever you're drinking. Click on the link below, sign up, and I'm really looking forward to your feedback.